Hello and welcome. I am Gohar Raza and you are watching Eureka. Human quest for knowledge knows no boundaries. It doesn't just stop anywhere. One question leads to answers and those answers lead to many more questions. And that is how younger generation have moved from one stage of evolution of knowledge to another generation. This quest has led us to understand human body at molecular level, which is very difficult and it is at the cutting edge of science at the moment. We do not think of body as a body. We went from body to cellular level. And now today, we are in a position to peep into cells and know what happens there at molecular level. And somebody has come with the idea that there are lots of motors moving around within the cells. And at times cause also traffic jams probably. We'll come to those questions, but before that, let me welcome Dr. Roop Malik. Hello. I'm very glad that you agreed to come here and give us time. My pleasure. Uh, let's go back to your Allahabad days. Okay. You were born in a family yes. uh, where your mother was a teacher yes. and a principal of a college, mm -hmm. and your father was an engineer. And it intensely affected your upbringing. How do you reflect back on those days? Uh, what I liked most about growing up in Allahabad, which at that time was a kind of a smaller city, was the... It was a small but always bubbling with lots of intellectual activities. Lots of intellectual activities. Physics, lots of chemistry, energy, environmental yes. sciences to culture. literature. And, and culture, culture and literature, absolutely. And... Uh, Though I was probably, you know, too young to understand these things at that time, but growing up in such a potpourri of, you know, uh, uh, situations, uh, I think it broadened my mind a lot. I used to visit uh, the places where my parents uh, worked uh, at that time, and uh, it was not on their insistence, it was on my insistence that I used to uh, go there. And, uh, like, I would go to my mother's college and see that, you know, I was a kid maybe in third or fourth class at that time and I would see that, you know, these are quite old people who are still studying. So that kind of gave me the impression that, you know, you know, gaining knowledge and education is something which is not going to end. You know, it is something which, you know, which we are still trying to do uh, as long as we live. Uh, so that uh, really kind of maybe turned me towards education at some point of time. I am not sure exactly, if, uh, you know, where. Uh, and then also I used to visit my father who was uh, like a machine designer and you know... They mechanical were, engineer. Like a mechanical engineer, yes. And, uh, I and his specialization was gear, which affected <laughs> your research later on. Yes, to, maybe to some extent, yes. And uh, so I was very keen to try and understand how these, you know, maybe little or maybe not so little uh, machines which he, let's say, you know, I can give you an example, you know, we used to buy these bulbs earlier, right? And those bulbs would be packaged into cardboard containers so that the bulbs won't uh, crack up. And how that packaging happens was very interesting to see. It's not so simple if you want to make a machine to do that. So these things, uh, I think they somehow, you know, in a wholesome way uh, led to my intellectual enhancement uh, in those days. But, you know, obviously it is not just your parents who affect you. I mean, it is uh, the friends with whom you grow up, you know, you know, you do all kinds of things, not necessarily studies, but, you know, going to college, you know, running away to see movies. We have all done that. And, you know, that's... How do you remember your school? Uh, okay, so uh, my earliest school that I remember was something called Little Folks Nursery. Okay, and that uh, was a place where, uh, at least in all the photographs which I see of myself in that school, I am sleeping all the time. <laughs> so, uh, I have very fond memories, particularly of my teachers, and uh, many of them are no more. But uh, whenever I go back to my hometown, I try to see if I can uh, visit them. But again, it was a place where you 
got to know many people with many different viewpoints. And somewhere, I guess, uh, going to school, the most important thing is to try and understand that different people will think differently, even at that age. And to be able to assimilate all that and, you know, take that with you as you grow is, I think, very important. Your, your father was your role model, probably. To some extent, And you yes. wanted to become an engineer. <laughs> Uh, at some point at of some, time, yeah, yeah, what yeah. turned you towards physics and why uh, did you do physics? Right. So there was a point of time where kind of uh, towards when I was ending my graduation, I uh, did not want to continue in physics uh, in the sciences. I kind of wanted to take up a job where I could earn something. But I spent a few years outside the basic sciences. Why was that? Why did you uh, want to earn partly, money because mm, that your maybe, parents were probably no, earning it was, sufficient? Yeah, that was not the problem. But that, you know, this was in the early 90s. It was a, you know, very tumultuous time in the uh, in, in the history of our country where this Mandal Commission and, you know, all these Atyata. There was very disturbing periods, particularly for, you know, people like us who were growing up in the northern cities. And uh, somewhere, you know, it took my mind off studies for some time and I wanted to do something else. But And university was center of turmoil? In general society, I would yes. not say just the university. And then, uh, but I realized after a few years of being, you know, doing something else that, uh, no, this is what I wanted to come back to. And then when I came back to doing a master's uh, in physics, it was with a renewed vigor. No, I, by then I had realized that this is what I really wanted to, uh, wanted to do. And specialized in physics. Yes, specialized in physics. And then when I went on to do a PhD in physics, and then I went... What was the problem that you took up in, in, in for, my, for, for your PhD? For my PhD, PhD. yes. So, uh, very broadly in simple terms, uh, you know, when you apply, you take any kind of material, okay, and you apply a voltage across it, and you can see some current passing through, which is because of electrons which are moving inside that material. These electrons have uh, spins. You can think of them as little magnets. And uh, when that electron is passing through the material, in that spin may be fluctuating, going up and down. But the electron is not the only one who has the spins. There are atoms sitting in that uh, material, which um, make part of its crystal lattice, which also may have a spin. So how do these, does the spin of the electron interact with the spins of the lattice? And how does this change the function of temperature? What does it mean for the resistivity of the material, for its thermal properties? These are the broad questions which uh, we were trying to address in my, in my thesis, which I did. They had nothing to do with machine design at that no, particular no, time. No, 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 no. Don't go no. anywhere. We'll come back. It's time for a break, but we'll be back soon. Welcome back. Dr. Malik, we were discussing that how your affinity towards a particular subject, that's mm -hmm. physics, uh, was in doldrums right from the beginning. There was some problem and uh, when you got an opportunity, you immediately switched over to biology. Uh, uh, would you like to tell the story? It's very interesting how, switched, how you switched over. No, to that's biology. not, in, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing what I was doing for my PhD and uh, uh, I, I, I still go back and attend those seminars and talks. But at some point of time, my thesis advisor, uh, he maybe, you know, your mentors see things in you which you may not. Uh, he actually suggested to me that I should consider, uh, you know, making a switch to biology because uh, that was obviously an upcoming area. and. There, uh, you know, he must have and there was fusion happening between physics and absolutely. biology at that and time. Absolutely. And that is, um, I mean, to a large extent that is true because of the nature of the Tata Institute where I work, where, you know, I had friends who were biologists, I was, had friends who were chemists, all kinds of things. So, and he suggested to me that, you know, you should consider this. Uh, at the same time, I also met somebody who's my, currently my, my wife now, who was a biologist. Uh, she was a student uh, there. So maybe a combination of both of these things. But I uh, then gave it a serious thought and I said, let me try it out. Maybe, you know. So your love work. affair started with biology <laughs> as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, yes. then I, uh, but I did not get into biology directly. Uh, there was a position vacant in the in in the institution in Tata Institute where uh, the uh, Professor G Krishnamurti, who is actually a chemist, uh, 
he was trying to address some biological uh, problems. So I did a brief one year, I worked uh, with him from, for one year in the chemistry department at Tata Institute and where I kind of got my you know, first view of proteins and all of the things that I talked to you very confidently about today, but you know, I didn't know any of this. Uh, six or seven years ago. You had to educate, re -educate I had to educate myself, somehow. yes, absolutely. I had to, you know, go back to the textbooks, which I had never read because I was never a student of biology at all. But then, you know, one thing goes, I mean, it takes you to another. But uh, somehow, I, uh, you know, as I've written somewhere else, is that uh, I knew that I didn't know much, okay? But I never let that bother me. Uh, I thought, mm. okay, I'll take it one at a time and let's see where we go. And then, I spent about a year. Was in it the, the confidence that was instilled by your parents uh, that you can it, it, acquire knowledge in any area if you have basic knowledge and intelligence? Yes, I think yes to some extent that, and also uh, uh, during my PhD, I had largely worked alone. I was the only student in the lab for a significant period of time, and I had to do everything on my own. And that I think gives you a lot of uh, confidence that you know you can handle the situation. And uh, that, I think, maybe that helped me uh, go on. But that being said, uh, you know, confidence is not something that you can get only in a limited area of science. By doing other things, by going out, meeting other people, you know, going somewhere on your own, these things also give you confidence, which in some way may manifest in the science that uh, you, you do also as well. had always love for working with hands. Yes. And designing instruments for yes. yourself. Yes. Which led you to design this laser, which yes. is a wonderful uh, instrument yeah. to peep yes. into cell. Right. I mean, that's not something which, you know, I have discovered or anything, but the, the, I, I made my own version uh, in some ways. And that allowed us to, you know, exert forces on things using the laser. That's a very well known technology. It's not something that I have discovered, but I could make my own instrument to do the same thing. Uh, which is what I did when I went to California, Irvine, to do uh, where I worked for about five years with uh, Stephen Gross, and who was a great mentor. And you know, he and he was looking. It was a chance. It was a chance encounter. Exactly. Encounter. Right. It was a chance encounter with one email. Right. With one email, and you know, so he had sent an email to various people, and I happened to see that email, and I thought, okay, uh, so uh, you know. It's not that things happen. He was enough. looking for a biologist. He, who, uh, he was looking for a physicist who knew biology or had interest in biology. I think he never admitted it openly, but I think he was looking for a physicist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because so, he was right. himself from he physics himself background from, who had switched over to biology. Right. But that being said, he really did not want to solve problems in physics. He wanted to solve problems in biology, which is a very valuable lesson that I learned from him. Because many people who come from physics to biology ultimately want to do physics. That's not what I want to do. I want to solve biological problems which are biologically important, but understand the physics behind those biological uh, problems. Processes. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. So once you started working mm -hmm. and uh, educating yourself in biology, right. what kind of problems did you face? One, that it was a cultural shift from India to US. Yes. That mm. was one. Sure. And two yeah. was a cultural shift from mm. one discipline, which is very straight-jacketed, mm -hmm. mm. known to be high-end right. science, right. and coming mm. to biology. Mm. So, so, so the biggest problem that I faced, Nishir, was to try and understand what is important. Okay, so this is a vast field. And, you know, there are many people doing many kinds of things. And, uh, you know, to me, what is important, and in the big picture, if I start to work on a problem today, 10 years down the line, is this going to be important at all or not? And that is a very difficult question to answer. You cannot answer that, you know. Uh, question easily. as a student, definitely not. As a if student, you have a good yes. mentor, right, maybe you Right, can. right. And I, maybe at that time, because of my background, which had, there was no biology in that background, I did not have that vision. As far as yeah. you are concerned, as, far as, as a as scientist. Yes. I have yes. to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back soon. The discussion will continue. Welcome back. Dr. Roop Malik, we were discussing that how you got into the area of biology mm. and uh, your knowledge of physics was a major aid for you to crack certain problems. Right. Now, the problem that you have cracked is very interesting, in fact, and very useful probably 
it will open up a lot of doors for new research and also we hope so yeah for mm -hmm. uh, a lot of medicines probably would would, would at some point of mm -hmm. time uh, cure for many diseases will come about would you like to explain how you hit the idea of this motors carrying uh, uh, particles, pathogens, foreign? These are very complex things for a man right. or for a common person like me to understand. Right. So uh, this that these pathogens or many other particles, for that matter of fact, that they are carried around by these motor proteins, it is not something that you know. This was well known. Okay, and this has been known for decades now. Okay, people have been using the microscope to look inside cells, and you can see things, you know, just moving across. It's a marvelous thing when you see it for the first time. Uh, but uh, what coming back to what my uh, area of work is right now, uh, what we were able to uh, show is that uh, when something is taken in, into a cell, the let's three. Say, Motor proteins, right? Three classes large, of motor proteins. By large, three kinds by, by of. Large. There are other ones, but these. Let yeah. us and you are interested in one of them because it it makes a uh, an odd right. uh, presence it, in the set. It is set. We were interested in this particular one. Uh, it is called the dynein motor because right. uh, we found uh, a few years ago that it is very it is able to work in large teams. Okay, so you take one, two, three, four, and if you take a certain number of these dynein motors, their function is proportional to their number. This is not necessarily true for other motor proteins. So uh, now, why is that important? It is important because you need the same motor to do many different kinds of things inside the cell. And you may be able to tune that function just by tuning the number of the motor, which you assemble at a location inside the cell and ask it to do something. Uh, this may not be true for other motors, at least uh, our present knowledge the other says two. that. Other two, uh, yes. Uh, it's what our present knowledge says, but these things, you know, uh, we keep updating all this. But uh, so, so what we were then interested in understanding, okay, if nature has made this motor so that it can work in large teams, how do you assemble such teams? Inside and they cells? almost function like a car. Which yes, in some loads. ways, it burns fuel, it carries a load, it goes from one place to the other. That's a very good analogy. Ex exactly, that's a good analogy. And this particular car uh, also has a gear built into it. Okay, so Which it is, is what your contribution is. Which is what, uh, you know, me, when I was Major. working in Irvine, which me and my mentor, Stephen Gross, we found that. So it's our contribution to the field. But later, when I came back to India, uh, I started working here. What I was, I think we were able to show how this gear is useful. Just having a gear uh, is, is good, but then how is it really useful to biology? And somewhere you have written in your paper that right. these are four gears probably. Uh, yes, moves so at given, the, uh, given the experimental evidence, we feel that there are maybe three to four gears in, in, in this uh, machine. Does uh, it have to do something with the, your father's work that <laughs> Kate, Kate kept coming back to you time and again. Maybe deep in my subconscious, yes, uh, that I could visualize something like this uh, happening may have something to do with my visits as a child uh, to his uh, workshop. Yes, but uh, yeah, but it's somewhere there in your subconscious, and these things do matter at a, at a later age. But coming back to uh, this, so we realized that this thing can work well in large teams, and then we were. What the latest work we are finding is that um, cholesterol, which is something which we all love to hate, you know, uh, <laughs> you start worrying about cholesterol at, uh, when you cross 40 or so. But this particular molecule, cholesterol, seems to be the basis on which these large teams are assembled. So what is good in some, uh, what is bad in some ways, having too much cholesterol is bad for you, uh, you know, but you do need cholesterol for other things also, which may be to clear pathogens when they uh, infect you. Pathogens like, you know, uh, uh, typhoid, uh, the, the bacteria that causes typhoid or tuberculosis. Or maybe um, many other particles many which other invade particles. your body. Yes, all the time. All, all the, the time, time which yes. you need to clean. Which you have to clean it out and, you know, that's how we are what we are. Otherwise, we would, you know, we, we would have so many diseases all the time. Uh, how did you come to the conclusion mm -hmm. that this this uh, dynein right. uh, has a gear system? 
it must have been a very difficult process by which you come to this kind of conclusion. Right. right. So, uh, I'll give you a short answer. We, so, these motors, when they move from one place to the other, they take steps like we do. They, they walk like, in some ways, like human beings, like taking steps. And what we could find in our experiments that the size of this step which dynein takes was not the same all the time. If we pulled it back, then it started taking. How did you pull it back? So that's you, very interesting. Right. So you can. So as. Uh, so just uh, so that we understand what's going on, these are really small things that we are talking about. We are talking about things which are one billion times smaller than the scales that we are used at to. At nano okay? level. At nano level, absolutely. These are nanoscale machines. So. To pull them back, what you do is that you attach these motors to a, a particle, okay, which is a, let's say a micron size particle and you pass a laser light through it and that laser light, light as many of you know has, is made up of photons. Okay. That laser light exchanges momentum with the particle to which this motor is attached and when that momentum exchange happens, there is a force which is applied by the laser light on your motor protein. And that force can be calibrated by uh, ways which I will not go into right now. And when you calibrate that, you can now, if this thing is trying to pull something out of this laser light, you can measure that. This is called an optical trap. And then you observed that at then, different levels of load, yes, this dynein takes steps, takes of, different steps size. of different sizes. Exactly. Which also means that the work work done uh, yes work done is different for it, different loads. actually not the work done is the same but the force applied is different so the product of the force and the step size which is the work done remains constant when the step size is large the force is less so that product remains constant it's like climbing the hill in some ways yes. if it is in some steeper ways. right so then you, you take a smaller steps but yes, you yes, move but on. you can at, at least you move can. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah mm. exactly so some some analogical uh, something to that analogy we we're able to find is going on at the nanoscale level in cells. And how do these pathways work in a cell uh, uh, on which these, these motors travel right. so, or cars travel? Right. So these are long filaments of a particular protein. In this case, this protein is called tubulin. Okay. So you take many units of tubulin and attach them one to the end, one to the end. So therefore, you have a long polymer of tubulins, uh, which is called a microtubule because it actually looks like a tube. And uh, this tubulin, these motors can actually recognize this tubulin, which is now in a form of a polymer. So they know that here is my road, okay. And they go and attach to the road and then they use chew molecules of adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy source in your cells. And by doing so, they can actually walk along this road as they use the energy from the ATP molecule. And there some of them change gears, some of them do not. Don't. How do you, as a very young scientist, how do you look at the future of science in the country? Uh, it is quite mixed. I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Uh, uh, if I talk about, uh, you know, the kind of fields which I work in or in which my colleagues work in, there is a lot of interest internationally. If you go outside India, now people really think of India as a powerhouse of knowledge, not just things like IT. Of course, we are doing very well there, but uh, they do see the quality of the science which Indians do when they are abroad, They're, when they are working in labs all around the world, and it is, you know, second to nobody. So, uh, and uh, over the last maybe five or ten years, uh, many of these people have been coming back to India, so there is no reason why they cannot do well uh, here. And many of them have started producing results. Paraphrasing so, what you have said is that India needs many more people to work. Absolutely. With facilities that are international level. Right. But right. the human mind that is required and is the first thing. Is it, the first thing, and the, it, it should it, be it, mentored and trained properly so, in the country. Yes, and the, the the other thing which I would like to take this occasion to point out is that when you want to do cutting edge science and a sufficient quantity of that science, you also need the industry to support it. Okay, the biotechnology industry, let us say, which will support the best science, that I think is still lacking to that extent in India. Mm -hmm. Most of the reagents that we need, most of the, you know, things that we need to get done, we have to go, you know, some company which is outside India, very often. And there are companies in India, but I think if with time, if there are entrepreneurs who take up these issues and 
you know, uh, who people who understand science, understand the needs of science, there is a lot of employment opportunity which is possible in the uh, uh, country. So, I mean, science, the purpose of science should be to generate employment uh, as well, as well as generate right. knowledge. And I think that there is a big opportunity. Scientists don't that. work for money, but they yeah. do require money to survive and create Absolutely. facilities. Absolutely. Now, would you like to give a message to the younger generation? I, uh, the message I would like to give is that uh, expect failures. Okay, if you, if I'm talking about if you want to be a scientist, you should expect failures. Things to rarely work, but uh, learn from your failures and uh, do not be bogged down by the failures. Uh, they are bound to happen. But how you learn from your failures is the first thing. And I have failed many, many more times than I have succeeded. Okay. People look at your successes, but your successes are, you know, come because of your failures. So, learn it, to deal with failures. Is in what science, it, it's failure which leads to success. Absolutely. It's not other way around. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it is true in many other fields also, but certainly in science, if you want to do something difficult, uh, uh, then you will fail many times. Every failure is a learning Absolutely. step. Absolutely. Uh, towards success. Yes. Thank you very much. It was just Thank wonderful you. talking to you. My pleasure. It has been a very inspirational talk. Thank you. May I on your behalf promise our viewers that you will be happy to answer questions if they have any? Sure. Please. Yeah. Do write to us. Our email address is eurekarstv at gmail.com. We'll be back next week with another outstanding scientist. Till then, goodbye.